Good evening, everyone. My name is Anakshi Sokti, and I'm the CEO of the Asia Society India Center. I'm so delighted to welcome all of you to our program this evening. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, Asia Society is a leading educational organization dedicated to building awareness about art and culture, business, policy, technology, and education from across Asia on a global stage. At the India Center, our cultural programming is committed to recognizing and foregrounding the diversity of contemporary art, literature, museums, and archives, and regional artistic traditions, not just from India, but from across South Asia. This is our last arts program for 2021, but we have an exciting calendar planned for 2022. So please keep following our website and social media handles to know more. This evening, it's a pleasure to have with us the incredible Dolly Thakur and Samira Iyengar in discussion on Dolly's exciting memoir titled Regrets None, published by HarperCollins India. Dolly is a familiar face in Mumbai with her signature big bindi, her bangles and beautiful saris. She's a veteran actor, newscaster, columnist and casting director who's also worked in advertising, communications and public relations. In this book, she showcases an insider's look at the worlds of glamour, fashion, theatre, film and advertising from the 1960s till today. She speaks candidly about love, sex, infidelity, motherhood, commitment, the ecstasy and the heartbreaks. She emerges as a true-blooded embodiment of what it means to be a strong, empowered, vulnerable, courageous and often outrageous, I'm sorry, sometimes outrageous woman. She will be in conversation with creative producer and theatre person Samira Anger, who's been working in the field of theatre and the performing arts for over 20 years. In 2012, Samira co-founded Junoon to share the richness of the arts with people across India. Her particular passion lies in mobilizing the performing arts as anchors for public discourse towards the proliferation of critical thinking, ideas and understanding. This program is the fourth and final one in the first season of Beyond the Ordinary Library Series with Asia Society, developed in collaboration with HarperCollins India, which is focused on extraordinary non-fiction writing from India. A bit of housekeeping before we proceed. We'll end the program with a QA and a session, but we encourage you to post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. For our audiences on Facebook, please drop your questions in the comments section. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. A very big thank you to HarperCollins for partnering with us on season one of our library series. As we wrap up a tumultuous 2021, I wish all of you happy holidays. Here's hoping 2022 is better and brighter for all of us. And with that, Samira, over to you. Thank you, Inakshi. It's such a pleasure to be uh, invited to have this conversation with Dolly. And, and you know, after reading the book, it's, it's really even more exciting. Uh, Dolly, uh, thank you so much for writing the book that you've written. But before we jump into conversation, I thought it might be fun for us to go through some of the photographs that sort of show your journey um, and then begin the conversation. If that's fine with you? Anything to do with me is lovely. Carry on. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, if we could please, so if we could please uh, show the presentation. Oops. These are just some of the pictures that are in Dolly's book, Dolly in Theatre which is afraid through the book.
Thank you. Dolly, you've mentioned in your book that you started writing it almost three decades ago and it stopped and started and stopped and started. And then finally you make the dedication that you wrote it for your son, Kwasar. And uh, I would love to hear if you could tell us about what made you finally say, okay, this book has to be written and the process of doing it. You know, um, I'm a very confident young old woman now. And therefore, um, I wanted to share uh, the trajectory of my life with everybody. There's not an episode or a year or anything that I am embarrassed about or insecure about or um, not happy about. We all go through life with ups and downs. And of course, I've had my share of it. But that hasn't made me bitter or prejudiced or in any way feel insecure. And I want all young women and men to accept that, that this is all part of life. Not That's everything wonderful. is a success. I haven't come first all ever, ever. In fact, I was always third or second. But I mean, that didn't make me in any way feel um, inferior to anybody or insecure. I was not as rich as everybody. I was not as fair as everybody. But, you know, I mean, and these are the complexes that we grow up with. And these are what make us all uh, then uh, determine where we stand and what we're going to do. None of that affected me. And I want to give people courage that, that that doesn't matter how tall, how dark, how fat, how pretty, how uh, clever or what you are. Whatever you're doing is your work and be proud of it. So how did you finally get around to getting the book written though? I mean, because of the stops and well, starts. It started in 1982 when there was an emotional uh, setback. Um, um, and, I, and I've still got those rough pages with me, but I had to work much harder because remember, as I said in my book, I always shared expenses. Okay, there were certain luxuries I couldn't afford because the, my partners were a little better off than I was, but I paid for the rent, I paid for the gas, I paid for the electricity. We shared half. I mean, I'm not saying that I paid all. But suddenly you had the car, you had the telephone, you had the parties, you had, you know, uh, the uh, uh, entrance into a, uh, a different kind of, I wouldn't say five-star life because I don't think any of us had that kind of five-star living. But it was better than what I was used to. So I had to work very hard when I was suddenly left with a child and I had to, the, the bills, instead of being divided into half, I had to pay all of it. And I must say, I've never looked back. I've never asked anybody uh, for help. I've never extended my hand, but I worked hard. I never refused anything that came my way. And I did lots of commentaries and writing and acting, television radio and we just paid 18 rupees every sunday for my woman's world program that i used to do and television used to pay us 50 rupees a day in those days uh, but per turn um but it was all what i wanted to do i loved it and i did it very merrily and happily and that's something that comes through so much in your in your book actually because you you not only list out the variety of the kind of work uh, that you do, but you also, uh, I mean, you're traveling all over the country, you're traveling all over the place. And one of the things that really stands out for me, Dolly, is, is the complete intrepidness with which, uh, you know, with which you've lived, which you seem to have lived life. It's like, you know, you get a chance to go to London and you go without knowing for sure if there's a job there or something, and then you travel off to Berlin, etc. That's what life is, Samira. If you sit back and say, oh my God, I can't do this because I, I'm not of that family, or I don't have a big long car, or I don't have a huge big house. God, you'll get nowhere. I never allowed anything like that to deter me. And I so didn't come, as I said, I came from an Air Force background, very middle class. But what was lovely was that we had no um, prejudices about language, caste, food, color, uh, region that you came from. We, it, it, it was our India. We were all together. It was wonderful. And one of the things that really stood out for me from your book is, you, you know, you talk about that birthday party you have in, in London. Mm -hmm. And you say, 
I had been there for seven months and there were 90 people that I had to invite. And I'm thinking seven months and 90 people. I'm going to actually ask you, and you know, there's this fantastic gift that you seem to have that goes through the book where you just gather people. You know, there's this whole wonderful because gathering. I was involved in so many things. So I had the BBC crowd. I had the uh, Pravasini, which was the Hindi magazine crowd. And I had the uh, theater crowd, which included Said Jaffrey and Zora Segal and these were all very eminent people at that time in London, but nobody knew them. Even in London, nobody knew them. We right. were all commoners fighting for a cause, making a living. And right. uh, so I just ha had to, then I had my Cambridge crowd and my Oxford crowd. I, I had everybody over for my birthday. So that's how I, I and the same happens in Bombay. I mean, yeah. my, uh, the flat that I live in is very, uh, uh, not as large and spacious as most people have, but I've accommodated a hundred people in it. And people wonder how that is done. But everyone is welcome. Every door is open. Every step has a person sitting on it. And that's what my life has been. And I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I wonder if we can give the, the audience here a peek into one of the ways in which you gather people. And if I could ask you to please read uh, the story about Michael Kohler, which is, which is such an interesting, it has so much in it. Okay. Uh, all right. I think that is in uh, on page 209, I think. Yes, That's absolutely. Um, in March 1979, I was in Madras to record an episode of Bonnie Baby Time. We were staying at the Taj Karabandu, thanks to Glaxo. It was a Glaxo uh, program. Uh, we finished at about half past 12 in the evening and I asked my producer if I could try and make the flight back to Mumbai or oh, sorry Bombay in those days I had a ticket for the next morning it had just turned the 10th my first birthday as a mother and I wanted to try and make it back to Kwasar as soon as I could I was welcome to try said my producer if it didn't pan out I always had a ticket for the next day. The next step was to go downstairs and talk to the reception. I couldn't give up my room completely. With, what if I didn't get a seat? The Taj was reliably excellent. Go, they said, and come back if you can't make the flight. Also checking out at the same time was a gorgeous German man, a young Kabir baby look-alike in a denim suit. I took a cab to the airport, and while I was waiting for the Indian Airlines desk to open, I saw the same young man being ushered into the duty officer's room. He was flanked and trailed by a small mob of Indians. Clearly, I wasn't the only one who'd been taken in by his beauty. I leant across the desk. If he gets a seat before I do, I said to the man behind the desk, eyeballing him like I was a tough cop, I'm going to raise a hell of a stink. The young German fellow emerged after a while and came and stood beside me at the counter. I figured it was the best to get to know my enemy. So I bummed a cigarette off him. Contact made. I discreetly inquired what flight he was trying to get aboard and what number he was on the waiting list. He was going to Bombay, all right. He was waitlisted 13. I was 12. I turned back to the man behind the desk, trying to express some combination of triumph and implied threat. But the desk jockey had the last laugh. A busload of tourists had just arrived from Tirupati and neither of us was going to get on the flight. I asked the young man whether he was heading back to the Taj. He was a little startled. I explained that I'd seen him check out. He said he could, but he didn't know if he'd get his room back. Let's give it a shot, I said. And we hailed a taxi together. His name was Michael Coyla. And he was 23 years old. I asked if he was 
what he was doing in India, and he said he was visiting family. Oh, so your mother's Indian, I said, thinking that is a bronze skin and link to Kabir, whose mother was also a Caucasian, made sense. After all, his surname was German. No, he said, my father. I was intrigued. So he told me his story on the car ride back to the hotel. As a child, Michael had been the victim of bullying in school for the same bronze skin. He wouldn't, the world wasn't as accommodating as then, and certainly not in Germany, where they were grappling with their national identity. He'd become a hothead, someone who got into fights. Later, this is something I'd seen in my son. At the age of 14, Michael beat up another kid in school. And as punishment, his grandparents banished him to the loft. But this only stoked his rage. He spent his detention trying to destroy everything he could see, pulling down trunks and suitcases, flinging them around. In one of these suitcases, he discovered his parents' marriage certificate, dated a full year after Michael's birth. Something clicked in his head. The color of his skin, his parents' reticence, his grandparents' silence. He picked up the certificate and went to talk to his mother, Helga. It didn't take much for the truth to come tumbling out. Helga had been a student at Princeton. Michael had been conceived there. The result of a single encounter with a fellow student, an Indian with a distinctively common name, a fairly distinctive name. Suddenly, Michael had a mission. He waited until he graduated and found work as a journalist. He made some inquiries in Germany. They found two men in India with the same name. One was a politician in Karnataka, the other a vice chancellor of a university in a small town in South India. So at the age of 23, Michael came to India to find his father. He traveled from Delhi to Bangalore. He established that the politician hadn't been in Princeton at the same time as Helga. That left the vice chancellor. So that's one story. <laughs> and if we and then on page two, to uh, the next page, you go on to talk about how you and Michael have been friends since. And not only uh, were you friends, but you introduced him to all your other friends and built that whole circle of friends. It's fine, Dolly. Um, this is wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm just I'm just summing it up, saying that All you know right. that he, okay. that he, uh, okay. that you've been friends since, and then you not only were friends, you introduced him to your other friends, and then every time they went to Germany, they stayed with him. You stayed with him. He comes back here and stays with you. Kwasar, when he went with Midsummer Night's Dream, stays with them. And if I can just read no. that last, they came to London to see Midsummer Night's Dream. Sorry, correct, yeah. correct. They came to London to see Midsummer Night's Dream, and then you on page two one twelve, you sum it up. Um, if I can just pull that page out, uh, sorry, even I need specs now. Uh, <laughs> uh, and on page two one twelve, you you sum it up. You say I was just trying to bum a smoke off a white man so that he wouldn't take my seat on a flight. Chance is a subtle and glorious thing sometimes. You keep saying chance and luck through the book, and what I don't see chance and luck, Dolly. What I see is somebody who, uh, you know, I see this kind of fascinating stories and opening out to people and being really open to meeting people and, and connecting you know, to them. I've never hesitated. Yeah, when people <laughs> I know that, even personally. <laughs> yeah, and uh, things worked out fine. Yes. I never fell into a ditch. I never had an accident. You know, I mean, accident in, the, in terms of uh, losing out in life. And, and then you uh, keep... So getting you keep a job with the BBC, working with the BBC, doing all the things that I did. It was all part of my uh, positivity. So one of the things that, uh, you know, what I love about this book is the way you read it out. And that's why I really wanted people to hear you read is, is I really felt when I was reading it, like you were talking out. 
I didn't, you know, sometimes when a book is written, you feel it's written. But this book, I really felt it was spoken out. And I wonder if that just happened or if that was a choice you made or what was Argya's role in this? Was Were you speaking to him and therefore the voice came in? I'm, I'm curious as to how that happened. Perhaps because I had collected, when Kwasar eventually turned to me and said, Mama, why don't you write a book? And I handed over almost two and a half feet of paper, which were articles uh, uh, with uh, on the cover of Savvy, Ease Weekly, Femina, and all the things and all the articles I'd written. I handed over about almost a two foot uh, uh, high uh, pile to Argya. And he collated it all together very nicely without eliminating or changing the voice that I was, was saying it in. But he edited it out. And I think he's done a beautiful job. It is because you really, I mean, I really feel you speaking and that makes the stories even more vivid. And, you know, your your uh, PR communications, theater, everything comes into this wonderful storytelling in these episodes, not only from your own life, but also of other people, as you put in this book. And it's been such a delight. Um, what also, Dolly, that really struck me, and I want to say this as a woman, actually, uh, is that you speak so frankly and unabashedly. Uh, about experiences, you know, when the experiences that shame is usually attached to a lot, and you you really put it out there, and uh, and especially you you talk about your uh, seeking love, uh, but you also you also continuously in the book reflect upon the you various. Know, yeah. Most of us shy away from telling people what the truth is, and um, I didn't uh, when you're interrupted and fiddled with and paid attention when you're an adolescent. After all, your biological urges are all simmering at the time. But that's the truth. But people don't talk about it. Whereas I have put it out in uh, words and verbalized it. And but that's what's made me and hopefully now will give other girls courage to talk about it. Because it's a natural fact of life. It's not something that only happens to bad girls or to uh, uh, unhappy girls. It's part of growing up. Those urges, those uh, uh, stimuluses that people get. They, everybody feels that. But I know that we are brought up in this perhaps Jesuit way of thinking of what Jesuit is. Everybody, your grandmother, grandparents, your mother, father, constantly telling you, uske bare mein baat nahi karte. Usse nahi bolte. Aise nahi bolte. You know, but I mean, I uh, fortunately, in a sense, would say had supportive parents. They never condemned me. I defied them. They weren't very happy with a lot of the things that I did. But they never stopped me from anything. Like, like acting in a play, like being in a, uh, uh, taking part in all the international or national debates and things like that. They, uh, and my parents didn't come from a background where they, their education promoted those kind of things. But I did it. And that's what's given me the confidence now to say and do what I want. I want to connect this actually to your work with Ladley. Um... Uh, Dolly, because something I see a certain connect between this larger attitude you have, and in fact, the very uh, open eyed way in which you've talked about. Well, what you um, I, I must share with the people that at the age of 11, 12, okay, the, the Air Force camp that I re remember very vividly in Chakeri, which is the Air Force camp in Kanpur, where my father was. It was carved out of 22 villages. And so all our staff was from these villages, or the gardeners, the cook, the bearer, the ayah. In those days, each one of us had a, almost four or five attendants attending to you. And so in the summer holidays, I would escape while my parents were sleeping. And in an Air Force camp, everybody went to sleep in the afternoon. <laughs> I would uh, escape and go through the barbed wire and enter a village. And now the villages were beautifully, brilliantly clean. There was no plastic. So there was no way that you had to clean up or teach them cleanliness. They, had, they were very clean people, but they were illiterate. They didn't know, they'd never been to school. There were no schools. There was no one teaching them A, B, C, D or whatever. And I took great delight in going there during my two months of summer holidays and spending two hours in the afternoon just teaching them 
A, B, C, D. I hardly knew very much myself. I was 11 years old, but I still did it. And that gave me so much joy. But since then, I've always wanted to do social work and work with the underprivileged. And so when I probably came back to, uh, uh, then in London, I took part in uh, whatever parades were going on for the underprivileged, whether it was the Vietnam War or whether it was, you know, uh, the Indian communities that the, the dis discrimination and the, uh, between the color uh, sections, etc. But I was always involved in those kind of uh, projects. In 1971, 19th of November was Indira Gandhi's birthday, and she had come to inaugurate the uh, children's complex uh, there in Bandra, the Bandra Children's Complex, which used to be a beautiful building at the start of, at the end of Mahim Causeway, at the start of the way to the airport. And I happened to be there. And standing next to me was a lady who came literally up to my shoulders. And I'm not very tall myself, you can imagine. And uh, um, so I, conversationally, uh, I asked her, what do you do? And she said, I'm a social worker. And I said, oh, I've always wanted to do social work. But the image I had of a social worker was somebody arriving in big, long cars and chauffeur driven and the chauffeur opening the door and you stepped out and you start sorry. Because I had this image of Tara Ali Beg, people of my time and my vintage. And, uh, uh, and here was this little simple lady and she said she was a social worker. So I said to her, I've always wanted to do social work. And she said, uh, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm in the media. I was already on... Uh, radio then oh, and that was only all in the radio so he said she said oh, oh how lovely and she said uh, have uh, are you really serious and i said yes and she said give me a number where i can get in touch with you i didn't have a telephone number so i gave them the number of my neighbors and uh, 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 because in those days in one building there should be one telephone and everybody used that for, for a number and he uh, three days later i got a phone call and I was called downstairs. Initially, of course, I was taken aback because only in an emergency did people ever call you. And she said, Dolly, were you serious about social work? And I said, yes. She said, I'm Dr. Zuli Nakuda, and I'm going, to, I want to talk to you about this. And we have a project in Lunavla. And before I knew it, I had become an indispensable part of the National Sponsorship Council, the India Sponsorship Committee, and we went to Lonavla, and the things I did with them were amazing, amazing. I mean, as I said, my stories can go on and on and on. It's half my book, I think, almost. But uh, uh, that's how I started my social work. And then through that, I got, I did the talking book studios because of my voice and all in the radio and all that. I was invited by the National Association for the Blind to read to them. I uh, worked with Alert India, which is the um, Association for Leprosy Education and Eradication uh, Reconstruction, and then uh, Ladley came along. And I was asked to, uh, called by Bobby's sister, who founded Ladley, or Population First, and he asked me if I would be on their uh, committee also. And I've never looked back. And I'm still the national coordinator for the Ladley Girl Child Campaign. And we've just had the national awards. I don't know how many of people really watched it and were interested, but uh, that's my life. It's been my life. And the Ladley Awards are really interesting also because they look at the girls' experience. It keeps seems to keep expanding the way you look at girls' experience, which is we why I was thinking. We started out with it being uh, uh, to save the girl child because there were lots of abortions being done, a lot of girls being aborted. The girl child was being aborted. And the poor woman was had no say in it. So we started as that, but eventually it grew and grew and grew. And now, of course, uh, uh, even the figures have shown, the statistics have shown what impact we've made on in that score. So uh, that's one passion. Uh, the other passion that I would love to talk about, uh, Dolly, is our shared passion, which is the passion of theater. Uh, and, yeah, uh, 
<laughs> but uh, no, but it, 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 you know, you say in this book, like throughout, you keep saying theater was always there. It was for me a really interesting phrase that keeps coming out because actually you ex explicate so many other things. But it's like, you know, when things are there, there's like this solid rock and you don't always talk about the rock, right? And you talk about theater in that way in your book. Um, no, um, sorry, before, before, sorry, I want to interrupt you. So, but what also struck me interestingly is you've talked about so many things in your book. You've talked about meeting Rajiv Gandhi. You've talked about meeting Indra Gandhi. But the death that you speak about is Savdar Hashmi's death. That's the one you choose. Savdar Hashmi's death. That's the death you choose to speak about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I wonder if I could ask you to read from there and then we can jump uh, into theater and politics, please. Yeah. Um, do you remember which page it was? Yes, it is page 267. No, hang on. Yes, it is. Page 267. Okay. On the first day of 1989, I went to Pune. The Film and Television Institute had invited me to come and facilitate a module for news training. And I was in Pune when I received news that Saftar Hashmi had been killed. Hashmi was 34 years old. He was a liberal Marxist who had worked with a host of theatre companies, including IFTA, for whom he wrote the delightful play Mote Ram Ka Satyagre with Habib Tandir. He also founded Janam, Jan Natya Manj, the People's Theatre. Janam performed street theatre, mostly in working class neighbourhoods and factories and the like, trying to foster direct engagement with leftist ideology. It goes without saying, they were anti-establishment and anti-authoritarianism. In a country that had lived through an emergency and then in the tightening vice of the license Raj, it was not a difficult position to adapt. But Rash Hashmi was also an artist, not just an activist. He had a wide ranging set of interests. He wrote for TV, created work for children, made documentaries. God only knows what a man like that may have achieved with something like the internet at his disposal. On January 1st, 1989, Janam was performing Halla Bol near Delhi when they were attacked by a group of political goons. Just in case we harbor the belief that hooliganism and self-appointed vigilantism is a recent phenomena, Saftar Hashmi was wounded and succumbed to his injuries the next day. Janam, led by Hashmi's wife, Molushri, returned to the same spot on the 4th and finished the performance. We were still stumbling into the 90s, I thought. Thank you, Dolly. Um, you do this throughout the book, actually. You know, you point out, you see things that happen, like that paragraph we are talking about in case we, you know, uh, they were attacked by political goons, just in case we harbor the belief that hooliganism and self-appointed vigilantism is a recent phenomenon. You know, and you you bring in this sort of, um, you say earlier in the book that you're interested in politics and you keep on bringing this slant where you see the gap between, uh, you know, what is idealized and what actually exists on the ground. And I found that a really, really, uh, I just wanted to say that I found that a really fascinating part of the book in the same way that you were looking clear at in your own life. Uh, there was a way in which you were not... Um, you know, you've said before that you are a Nehruvian, you know, you're a product of the Nehruvian age, but a lot of people really romanticize that. And through the book, you don't seem to romanticize it. You see it for what it is and see the gap and see us moving out of the age into other times. And there are, there are powerful segments. We don't have the time to read them, but they're really powerful segments started throughout the book. And I just wanted to say this to those who may not have read the book that uh, for me, your book also not only brought life that time, but brought life the moving, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure that your are um, also, your being a news broadcaster would also kept you in touch with the news over and above your own interest as well. Um, 
I did want to step aside. Uh, if you wanted to say something about that, and then no, I'd I like to, want to say that out. I've always been interested in news and the topical stories. I have uh, always shared that and read my newspapers from cover to cover. I was very aware and alert about what was happening in the country, in the world. It's dwindled and diminished a little now, but at that time I was very active and uh, uh, wrote a lot about it, didn't write political columns, but everything that I took part in had a, a slant towards uh, uh, improving society, helping emotions, helping the underprivileged. So to theater, because one of the things I did feel in your book is that uh, I wasn't sure, but like for a theater person like me, I will read your book and I will get the references of what you're talking about when you're talking about theater being this thing in your life. But I wonder if you can chat a little bit more about what that, what theater is to you. you know, theater never paid. And I've never made, it's never paid any of my bills either. But I've been in the theater. I loved the attention. I loved the applause. <laughs> I loved the recognition. And in fact, as you can see, everything I've done in life has given me that kind of uh, uh, recognition and acknowledgement. Um, it all started at the age of five when I acted in a play. I played Krishna. The curtain opened. My sari fell out. They closed the curtain. They, uh, uh, the ladies came and tied up my, my uh, sari. And the curtain opened and a huge applause went up. And that applause, the hat kept ringing in my ear. And I still love the sound of that applause. So, you know, I had I had talked, uh, I had chatted with Dolly about the passages that she's written about love. And I was really uh, taken with uh, just the clarity, not just the honesty with which she wrote, but also the clarity with which she's written. So I just want to read a couple of them to juxtapose them, uh, because this is what happens in the book. There are actually patterns that keep coming back. So you're actually walking with Dolly as she uh, goes from a young Dolly to a, you know, like a 30s Dolly to a 60s, 70s Dolly. And you're seeing sort of life grow. And, for, you know, for that, I just felt that was lovely because it's it's sort of an, ex, you know, you connect to that kind of experience. Uh, so I'm while we are getting Dolly back on, uh, I'd like to read two sections. This is Dolly talking about first love. Um, she says, Sweetie and Bobby Johnson were regular visitors at Astrodon. Um Bobby and the third brother, Robbie, lovely as they were, I don't think anyone was putting too much thought into their names, continued to visit us. They were both 12 or 13 years older than me. And my memory of that time is tinged with a desperate aching sweetness. They were the world we wished to inherit, these strong, handsome, upstanding men. And yet we were just a tad too young. Our infatuations were guileless and naive, deeply romantic and frustrating in just the right way. Eventually, their term came to an end and Bobby came to spend his last night with us. In summers, we slept out in the garden, mosquito nets ranged over the beds under the stars. Mommy, Daddy and Pam, two beds under one net. Esme, Richie and I under the second. And Bobby, as the honored guest, had a bed and mosquito net to himself. Our beds were a foot apart. He and I stuck our heads out from under the nets, held hands and whispered to each other all night under that diamond encrusted sky. God knows what we talked about. We were young. He was gone the next morning, but I have never forgotten that night. I really loved the tenderness and the, I don't know, the youngness of the memory that happened. Okay, so the next bit that I do want to read um, this is when Dolly's with Alec and they've just had an experience uh, uh, where Alec has uh, Alec has suffered a, a loss of somebody in the family and they've been exhausted and, and you know, taking, you know, dealing with that. Um, and um, Alec went back to work on Monday morning. I was at Frank Simo's by then and it was easier for me to juggle my schedule. A few days later, the doorbell rang at 10 in the morning while we were both trying to get ready for the day. It was the police. They'd come to inspect the car, the smashed up little green herald that had been towed to our building and was parked downstairs. Alec was in a hurry to leave and I don't think any of us had properly, properly processed the events of the weekend. No, I'll just go down and see what these people want, he said. 
And I can't go down dressed like this. I was still in my night clothes. Well, get changed, go down and see what they want. But what do I say to them? I don't know, I'm late for work. But the fight erupted before I saw it for what it was. Within seconds, it had turned nasty while the cops waited downstairs, while two people were still in hospital days after multiple funerals. I've always understood why we fought. I never understood how it unraveled. At one moment, Alec whirled towards me. He took a step in my direction. Something snapped in my head. I cowered like a bad dog. Alec stared at me for an eternity. Then he got dressed and left. He must have attended to the police then because they never came up. That's all I know. I never thought about it. Sitting on the floor in my kitchen, I started to cry. That step towards me, it struck so deep, I wanted to die. Um, there's a knife I still have to this day. It's the largest one I own. I picked it up, I held it against my wrist. I moaned for hours because I didn't have words, not that day. I cried and I howled like he dripped my tongue out. I locked myself in. I lay on the gada in our bedroom. I didn't answer the phone. People banged on the door. They could hear me, but I wouldn't open up. First the neighbors, then friends, then Alex's family. It didn't matter. I lost hours just lying there on the gadda, huddled next to the door, knife against my wrist. Sometime that afternoon, there was a soft knock on the door. Dolly? I didn't answer. Dolly, it's Parveen. She had got out of bed and made her way here. Minus her husband, minus her little girl, her son in the ICU. She'd come to help because she could. Through my exhaustion, I saw someone extend a hand, a gesture I couldn't refuse. I opened the door. Did we talk about it, Alec and I? Not really. I'm sure there were flowers that night. I'm sure we made love. I'm sure we talked about how passionate we were, how that set us apart. I'm not sure we actually talked about it. How prosaic then. How like everyone else when we thought we were special. Love can be the most awful thing in the world. It brings out the best in you. And sometimes to preserve that illusion, we don't say the things we should. We were both guilty of it. We just didn't know it then. You know what I'd love to hear from people on chat though? If people, has who all have read the book? If you've read the book, can you note it here? I just love to see who all have read the, out of you who are uh, attending, who all have read the book. And I'd love to know what, I've been chatting about what I loved about the book or what struck me about the book. So it'd be great if people would like to share what struck them about the book. Oh, wow. So I'm reading out Divyesh's uh, uh, comment. He's saying my dad actually enjoyed it. He mentioned the word fearless and he went through it pretty fast. Nice. Okay, we have a question from someone whose name is not here saying, are there certain things you decided not to include in the book? How did you make those choices, if at all? Dolly. There's what, sorry? There is nothing that I didn't include in the book. There's nothing. Okay. So there was no, yeah. So you didn't, you didn't censor anything basically, specifically, basically. The question is, uh, you have traveled around the world seeking opportunities throughout your life. Given the need for virtual events, how do you feel about the scope of online theater and performance? And I was wondering if you talk a little bit about your Zoom experience and, you know, the kind of reach you've had. Look, I, I, I don't like Zoom experiences, but I've had to do it because it's been thrust upon us. I would much rather that it was reality, that I was on stage. That, and it was such a pleasure to see Lynette Dubey's uh, the, the lockdown uh, recently. <laughs> It was so wonderful to be able to see the people, see their expression, and actually at the back, at the end of it, go and touch them and hug them and tell them how good or bad they were. I mean, I, I love that. I don't like this uh, uh, Zoom experience at all. But this is the future of theatre, of technology, of people, of life, and we've got to accept it. But I certainly don't like it. I am old fashioned. I like the old system. 
Okay, yeah, I, you know, that's what I that's what I really miss also, Dolly, frankly. I don't mind watching stuff on Zoom, but I really miss being able to go and hug the actors or, you know, just that, that post, I miss the post show as, you know, that, that where you bring it all together. I really, really miss that. Well, we've got a show of Vagina Monologue on the 1st and 2nd of January. Two shows on the 1st and three shows on the 2nd at the Prithvi Theatre. Uh, let's see what experience that is going to be. But That's fantastic. We are there, we are in the theatre, and we're so looking forward to that. And you haven't thought of taking vagina monologues online? Uh, I think it was done once, but I was not on. Okay, okay, okay. So we've got a comment from Ankur Jain, which is who says, this is awesome. Come what may, talk should happen. I like this spirit. Keep it up. Brilliant efforts. Thank you, Ankur. <laughs> it's the show must go on, right? We come from that school, right, Dolly? <laughs> There's a... Here's another last, and perhaps this could be the last question. Uh, you have co-written this book with Arya Lahiri. I'm curious, what is the process of writing such an intimate text with another person? Now, you had said Arya collated the text. Uh, Dolly, were there conversations between you and him? Arya is somebody who I have now known for 20 years. So he was barely 20 years old when I first got to know him. He directed me in two plays. Uh, and I think he respected me and I respected his talent. I love the fact that I was acting and being directed by young people. And in any case, as I said my, in my life, nothing has been hidden, nothing has been concealed, nothing is a secret. So there was nothing to hide from Arya. So when he uh, was chosen and agreed to write uh, and select all my writing, um, it was a very comfortable give and take. And I was pouring my heart out to him uh, uh, on the tape recorder and everything. So he rewrote that and I reread those scripts. There was nothing at one edited. He edited it only from the point of view of the readers getting bored with things that I was doing, perhaps. So, there was no so Dolly. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you what next? What next? What's the what's the what's the pre, what do you call it? What's the sequel in your life to this book? Is what I'm going to ask you. Well, to see that what's coming up. Happy, confident, energetic. Um, in fact, yesterday I was at a Zonta conference where they showed all the women today who are prime ministers and ministers and presidents abroad, and. I'm sure that is going to happen in India. Right now, we don't have a woman who's that powerful, except for Maya Vadudu. Maya Vadudu. Mamata. Mamata, Mamata. Mamata Banerjee, yeah. Uh, but but uh, abroad, in every European country, woman, except for, of course, Angela Marcus, who just left. But otherwise, every single woman in, uh, uh, today as a president or prime minister, is a woman from New Zealand to uh, Finland to Austria to everywhere. And that is the power of women and that gives me great joy. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. We insecure, quite frankly, that we have arrived where we have because had we been given the opportunities earlier, we would have made a great difference in this world. You wouldn't have made such a mess of it. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dolly. I'm gonna. We are going to have to wrap up, but thank you for uh, you know. Even though we've had this hiccup, thank you for braving through it, and thank you very much, all the participants, for uh, staying with us and being patient with us. I hope you've had a lovely time with this talk. Uh, please definitely read the book. I promise you. I promise you it's 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 an important read. Uh, and especially if you're a woman, it's a very, very important read. So please do read it. Uh, I also want to thank you for uh, using the analytics words in the beginning of your book. This is the book I have never read, etc. Do you know how I feel? Which is your beginning uh, 
the thing and i'm a huge fan of annie lennox so it was wonderful to see that i don't know if that's you or arya but i was thrilled to see that there um i'm going to read out some comments to you dolly from the from the um uh audience uh lovely talk uh bravo dolly you are unstoppable and i think on that note we should say thank you very much everyone thank you dolly and uh enjoy the read and we'll see you at some point for another talk for another talk i'm sure you yes and if you're in bombay even if you have seen vagina monologues you have to come because theater is coming back up live where it has to be supported and it's a fabulous show so please do come thank you everyone thank you asia society for pulling this together